Today we're going to be looking at a video by a channel called Half is Interesting. Specifically, we're going to be looking at the latest video called Why It Takes Seven Plus Years to Shut Down a Nuclear Plant. But for those of you who don't know me, my name is Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry, from engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. And decommissioning, so full disclosure, never decommission a nuclear plant. That's very sad when that has to occur, but I do know a few about the basic steps. So, but first let's check out the thumbnail. Let's see, radioactivity map. Okay, I think, so he's referring to dose assessments and what areas are radioactive, what areas are not. Okay, that's, that's important. Transfer to dry storage, uh, that, that happens uh, already during uh, core refueling, but you will need to take the fuel from the reactor that you just shut down and ensure it goes into dry cast storage. Sure. Decontaminate waste. Um, again, that's a continuing act. That's a that's a continuous action that normally occurs in a nuclear power plant. But again, at this point, the source of production will be gone, so it'll be just what's left. And dismantling the reactor. Yeah. Custom ship components. What does that mean? Trying to see what you can salvage from the place. Never heard it referred to as that, but let's see what he means. In 2011, the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant in Okuma, Japan was hit with an earthquake and a tsunami, resulting in three nuclear meltdowns, three hydrogen explosions, and the spread of a whole bunch of nuclear radiation to places where radiation is not supposed to go. Fukushima, really bad accident. Not nearly as bad as Chernobyl, though, but it was a horrific scenario. Massive earthquake killed over 20,000 people, and that ended up causing a uh, nuclear power plant to have an accident due to an extremely long period of time without power. All of their backup systems, so the earthquake, the grid was destroyed. All of the backup systems became waterlogged from the tsunami and were not functional, so they went for a too long without power, and they weren't able to cool the... Uh, the reactor or the spent fuel pool because all of those systems relied on external power power supplies. And like I said, the backup systems were all gone too. If you want to hear more about the accident itself, um, I did a reaction video to a series called The Days uh, where I talk a lot more about the design and where a lot of their uh, vulnerabilities were. So I highly suggest you check that out. But anyway. That's not the topic of this video, so let's see how this feeds into decommissioning. Now, you might think that they got that situation all sorted out, since the world has since had at least three other bad things happen since. <laughs> still out there removing. <laughs> oh, if only, man. That that would be cool. Uh, one one crisis at a time, right? <laughs> I like that TikTok's one of them. That's uh, that's pretty good nuclear waste, decontaminating water, and dismantling buildings, and they predict they won't be done until at least 2051. At this point, you're probably thinking, 2051? That's so far away. I'll be able Well, they had an accident and a lot of remediation efforts were recovering. Although Fukushima wasn't nearly as bad as Chernobyl, but let's just give a bit of a timeline factor. That accident happened in 1986. They did immediate cleanup. A lot of it was the initial, the liquidators, their teams, that sarcophagus, all that took a few years, but that, but that was just a temporary short-term solution. The new safe confinement facility basically looks like an aircraft hangar. They slid on in around 2015. It's nowhere nearly as hot as it used to be, but it's, there's still a uh, radioactivity in there. That building is still you can get lethal doses of radiation if you're in the, the, actual, the building where the actual core was destroyed. To legally vote by then. But as it turns out, taking 40 years to shut down a nuclear power plant isn't unusual at all. In fact, even in the case of a totally non-tsunami nuclear power plant, the decommissioning process can take up to 60 years, with a lot of plants spending more time being shut down than they did actually operating. 60 years, um... So there's a, there's a few different methods, I think he'll get into them, but regular decommissioning, as it kind of goes with the title, is usually on the order of the 7 to 10 year time frame. But there is another type of decommissioning where you sit and wait for a lot of, I'm going to use the term medium term uh, radioisotopes to decay. 
as well as just securing funding for the operation because it's very expensive. It's, what's crazy is decommissioning, there's a lot of parallels to actually building a new facility. So why exactly does this kind of thing take so long? Well, let's look at three different ways you can decommission a nuclear power plant, which range from pretty timely to you'll be dead, your children will be dead, their children will be dead, and several more generations of children will be dead before this process. Okay, this is what I was figuring out. Yeah, because I was thinking regular decommission is, is, is the seven, seven to 10. Safe store is the, um, is the more longer term. And entombing, that's a... It exists, but it's kind of, uh, it, it's, it plays by its own little rules. Decon and uh, Safe Store are the ones that show up in the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's um, guidelines. Uh, Entomb is a little bit more out there. It's mainly for things where post-accident. Pleat. The first, and by far the fastest way to shut down a plant, is a process called decon, or immediate dismantling, and it still takes, at minimum, seven years to complete. That's what happened in Vermont when the Vermont Yankee nuclear power plant couldn't keep up with natural gas prices and shut down in 20... Oh, that's, that's a very sad story. Now, dismantling this building was a little more complicated than taking a wrecking ball to a haunted Chuck E. Cheese, and it's largely because it was radioactive. You can't just scrap everything and haul it off to a dump somewhere else in Vermont, lest you end up with the worst superhero of all time. Uh, yes. <laughs> I know he's saying this in jest, but the whole radiation's not going to give you superpowers. <laughs> Quite the opposite, in fact. So the first thing that usually happens in the decon process is the creation of a radioactivity map of the entire facility to identify where things are radioactive and how radioactive they are. So uh, let's let's back up a little bit. So there's a few things that you need to go that you need to go through before. And again, this this actually mirrors what it's like to build a new one. Um, the uh, the company that operates the plant needs to notify the Nuclear Regulatory Commission with the intent to dismantle, to decommission the nuclear plant, as well as other uh, local and state uh, government authorities. Then they need to develop a detailed uh, license termination plan that outlines all how the plant will be decommissioned, what the timeline's going to look like. The main concern is that, okay, it's decommissioned, is the area going to be restored to pre-nuclear plant levels? No, no, uh, no radioactive materials on site, and the place is just gone as far as um, administratively and as far as uh, regulatory control. This is no longer a nuclear plant. This is just a vacant lot. <laughs> and that, that plan also needs to be approved by the Nuclear Regulatory Commissions. Then you go into radiological cleanup mode. Because to make matters more complicated, radioactive waste, which in the case of a decommissioned nuclear power plant is pretty much every single object on site, has to be categorized into one. No, no. Um, any, uh, so objects in the radiological controlled area, which is already continuously mapped, uh, where a lot of the uh, mechanical components that interface directly with the nuclear part of the plant, everything within the reactor containment building and its associated auxiliary building. But the turbine building looks the same as the turbine building on a natural gas or a coal plant. Nothing there is radiologically controlled. While you do need to map that area, but to say that that area is contaminated, no. In fact, a lot of areas within the radiological controlled area are not contaminated. It's just controlled and that it's continually monitored and assessed for contamination. But majority of those areas aren't contaminated either. Of three levels of radioactivity, and each category has different rules on how it can be handled, packaged, and shipped. Some of the more hazardous components, like the core shroud and jet pumps, had to be disassembled and packaged underwater, and many of them could only be loaded onto a train after being put into custom boxes that had shielding specifically designed for the component it was meant to hold. So he's talking specifically, so these components are in the primary and interface directly with the reactor fuel and the reactor coolant system. So though, those equipments would indeed be, uh, be uh, contaminated. They, they interface directly with, with the nuclear fuel, but they can get decontaminated. And now they do have to be shipped in a, in a certain way just because it's, it's a large pressure vessel. There's only a certain ways you can do that. Then those boxes were, in turn, filled with concrete. Rent and repeat for several hundred more tons of equipment. And yeah, this takes a while. 
So some equipment would have to be um, done that way. Concrete is actually very good at, if there's anything that has any amount of activity left, uh, that's why containment buildings are made out of concrete. It's very good at stopping radiation, specifically neutron radiation from an operating core. Granted, there's no operating core at this point, but it's gonna block a lot of other uh, radiation types as well. The most difficult thing to move off-site is the nuclear fuel itself, because you see... So not what nuclear fuel looks like. Uh, <laughs> That's just a box with, that's just a barrel with a radioactive symbol on it. Here's what nuclear fuel up looks like all opened up out of its fuel assemblies. And these are the dry cast storage containers that it's stored in. Nuclear fuel is really good at being hot and it's really bad at stopping being hot. That's due to decay heat. Um, continuous decay of the radioisotopes does generate heat. Granted, it's way, it's way, way less hot than a nuclear reactor, but it's still of concern. Now, those dry cast storage containers, everything has, for one, already been in a spent fuel pool for a while, so a lot of that decay heat does go away over time, and they undergo forced helium drying in order to uh, remove all of that heat, and it's in a cask where it is secured and pressurized. Think of it as just a giant Coke can. In order to move the nuclear fuel, it has to be put in a container like this, called a dry Okay, cast. here we go. If you just drop the core of an active nuclear reactor into a concrete box and send that box onto a highway, something bad will happen. I'm not sure exactly what, but people a whole lot smarter than me have determined that that is a bad idea. That's more of, it's just an awkward shape to deal with, but putting a core with a concrete, but that's also... Now when he says core, uh, so spent fuel... That's actually what the core really is. Um, he showed a picture of a reactor vessel when he put it in there, but if there's no fuel in the reactor vessel, it's just a reactor vessel. But it's, it's, it's interesting that the definition of core really means just the fuel, because after all, you can't have a reactor without the fuel. But yes, dry cask is the preferred method. It's also more more practical and it meets all of the regulatory standards and it's very very tough those containers can withstand a direct hit with a missile they can also withstand severe weather if it's involved in a uh, truck accident and the truck gets destroyed that thing that thing's going to survive the uh, the wreck it's very very durable as far as something bad happen if you theoretically fill a thing with concrete it's just it's just not as it's just not as sturdy as uh, dry cask, but it's more of just a lot of that's concrete too. It's just arranged in a different way. But the idea of using a crate doesn't just doesn't make a whole lot of sense structurally. <laughs> So before the fuel can be moved to dry cask storage and shipped off site, it needs to be cooled down in a pool like this, and this mm -hmm. step alone can take years before the fuel is safe enough to be dealt with. Now, the process I just described is what happens when everything goes perfectly. Yes, uh, so it is cooled for several years. Uh, we had Before dry cask storage was implemented at the site that I worked at, we just filled up the pool and then we Pick the ones that were cooled off the most way and put them in dry cast first. That's no fun. So let's talk about some of the options when things go not so perfectly. <laughs> After shutting down a plant, the company that's running it might go, uh oh, our nuclear power plant is too radioactive and or no one wants to take our hundreds of tons of nuclear waste right now and or we ironically don't have enough money to destroy our own nuclear power plant. This is what happened at the Dwayne Arnold Energy Center in Iowa, which had to be shut down after getting damaged in a storm, forcing them to go with option two, safe store, or deferred dismantling. This involves taking the fuel out of the plant and then just letting the whole thing rot for the next 30 to 50 years before finally coming back and actually dismantling things. There, so no, safe store, you don't let the thing rot. You put it in a safe configuration to avoid that sort of thing from happening. Any. Now granted, I noticed he showed the cooling towers, which have nothing to do with the nuclear part of the plant slumping. Those aren't exactly a big concern. You just, you need to put stuff like that into consideration where, in a configuration that they're not gonna like fall on top of the containment building. Not that it would destroy it, but it would still, you don't wanna have any of the non-nuclear parts uh, aggravate the nuclear parts. You can even, you can even get rid of some of that stuff with deferred dismantling, because uh, it's mainly just the nuclear part of the plant that you have to go through these Whole processes, but you can take away a lot of the, a lot of the. Uh, so the non-nuclear plant is also called the balance of plant stuff. The uh, 
the secondary portions, a lot of things with like the on-site office buildings, those sort of things. You can get you can get a rid, of, rid of a lot of that stuff um, even ahead of time using a uh, safe store. And most people are probably going to be working out of trailers anyway for the next few decades. But monitoring still will occur. It is still required by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. It's not going to be much work, but mainly to make sure things are still there and nothing Nothing abnormal happened while the plant's sitting in that sort of configuration. This is actually a pretty common thing to do. Right now, there are 11 nuclear plants in the US alone that are in this state of nuclear level procrastination. But what's the point? Well, for one, a lot of the radiation will dissipate in those three to five decades, making everything a lot easier to deal with. But two, the company running the plant will have a lot more money to work with. At least in the US, when building a nuclear power plant, you have to create a trust fund for the sole purpose of decommissioning the plant when it's useless and ready to retire, which, as is the case with most trust fund recipients, is often far sooner than originally hoped. So hey, he did a good job bringing up the analogy of when you build one and when you decommission one, there's a lot of uh, similar type steps, but it's it's sad the ones, because a lot of the, the ones in the US that were shut down were due to unfortunate economic reasons and some of the people just didn't want the nuclear plant in the case of uh, San the San Onofre plant, which is sad because they can they can last their in the, the initial license of a nuclear plant is 40 years that can t that can get extended to 60 years, even 80 years. There's even talk about it being extended all the way up to 100 years, but nothing's that old yet. But which has a similar process getting a license extension that I talked about earlier with instead of a license termination plan, it's a license extension plan. It's usually contingent on a bunch of a lot of uh, maintenance activities, upgrades, replacements, engineering evaluations to make sure the place can still run like that. You still need to do that sort of stuff for, com for decommissioning, though. It's, you're just heading the other direction. And there could be some where the plan, the uh, radioisotopes are in such a way or the specific plant is it, that it makes sense to go the safe store option. A lot of this is site specific though. If the trust fund isn't big enough to cover costs when the plant gets shut down, these extra 30 to 50 years should do the trick. And that brings us to our final option called Intune or nuclear entombment. In this process, the facility will be sealed and covered in anti-radiation shielding, and then the entire thing will be filled with cement and left to sit forever. <laughs> I like that. You're including the cooling towers as part of it. Now, th those things long gone by the time you'd you'd resort to something like this. You you just need to do this for the uh, for, for the nuclear part of the plant. Basically, think of this as the nuclear equivalent of just shoving all your trash in the closet and then filling the whole thing with cement. It's not ideal, but it's sometimes necessary. In two minutes, not really much of an analogy. Faster, <laughs> or if there's very little money on hand, and even then, it's usually only partial entombment. One of the few examples of this is in Nebraska, where the Hallam nuclear power facility was only So this was a weird one. This is another, this is a case of a graphite moderated reactor, kind of like Chernobyl. This one had a bunch of, had a bunch of nasty fuel leakers though. So they just shut down the place and like, uh, -uh this, they realized that this was a bad idea. <laughs> operate for two years in the 60s before everything started breaking, and they just got fed up and buried the reactor underground. Fuel leakers, if you have something like that, um, where it's continuous in like the same sort of things, as well as issues with the moderator channels, there was a plan to fix it, which theoretically would have worked, but they just decided not to go with it instead, just shut it down. This was a small one anyway, only 75 megawatts electric, which is tiny compared to 1,400, 2,800, much larger uh, nuclear power plants that you see today. Part of the facility is still there, above ground, but all the important stuff is encased in concrete under this field here, which now has to be monitored for radioactivity until at least 2090, but will remain there in its tomb for much, much longer. What's interesting is that picture, I believe, is accurate because there's now a fossil plant there next to the carcass of a nuclear plant. That's sad. That that reactor needed to go. It, it, it wasn't a good one, but could have put another nuclear plant there. Full entombment is much rarer and really only used in cases like Chernobyl, where the situation was so dangerous that all they could do was build concrete walls around it until people stopped dying, which kind of worked, but also kind of didn't. And frankly, this is the end of the video and I don't want to open that can of worms right now. <laughs> If you're interested in my thoughts on Chernobyl, I highly recommend you check out my uh, reaction to HBO's Chernobyl series. I, I fill in a lot of gaps on that one. A few things he missed. 
uh, after the spent fuel and dismantling stuff. So environmental monitoring still needs to occur for a while. There needs to be a public engagement campaign so people can understand why they're doing what they're doing, why they're decommissioning, because the laypersons are probably going to ask, well, is everything wrong? Is there a safety concern? Which is, all, which is all fair questions to ask, but just to get those concerns addressed so the decommissioning can proceed safely. And um, ideally, the, uh, the area would be restored for, as a vacant lot to, for some other usage. And I'm going back to talking about the first type of uh, decommissioning. There also needs to be a final radiological survey before closing it out to that sort of thing. And it's got to uh, meet the Nuclear Regulatory Mich Commission's criteria for, uh, for public use. Then the license is terminated by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Uh, the, the license saying that this company can operate this, this nuclear power plant because you don't need it anymore because the decommissioning is complete. That cannot be done until the decommissioning is complete. And they'll still be monitoring plans post-decommissioning just for more, uh, more long-term issues. Uh, some of that will be done by the NRC and some of it by the utility. And then, ultimately, site restoration, so you can just convert it into something else, whatever you want to build there instead of a nuclear power plant. And, but again, all of these steps are very location-dependent. Um, not just because of the physical layout of the plant, but also the different uh, state and local regulations that, that would come into place for your specific site. It is a very closely monitored, arguably even more so than construction, because when you're decommissioning, you are telling the NRC that there's no nuclear plant here anymore, and it is safe for public use. So I would say their standards are even higher than they normally are for decommissioning. There's definitely a lot of intricate steps, but um, a lot of this is very avail uh, publicly available right off the NRC's website because they just try to be as open and candid as they can with uh, concerned citizens uh, of what the, what the steps are and what the timelines look at. But yes, it can take a long time and, and in, in some cases longer than it takes to build a nuclear power plant. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.